Hi everyone, it's James from Community Legal Centres Queensland. Welcome to another one of our important CPD webinars for community lawyers and um, our supporters. Um, for those that have played before, I might just get you to press that hand button on your control panel to make sure that you can hear me. Terrific, there's a heap of hands going up there, so I'll take it that uh, communication seems to be working fine from our end. Thank you for that. Um, I begin today's session by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're gathered. So um, Steve and I are here in the Community Legal Centre's Queensland office in Brisbane, so I acknowledge the Turrbal and the Yagara people as the traditional custodians of this land and pay respects to elders past and present, um, to emerging leaders in those communities and um, and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be joining us today. I also acknowledge that there are a number of people from um, other parts of uh, the state and indeed other parts of Australia, so I acknowledge First Australians on those lands as well. Uh, particularly relevant given the significant number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are engaging with the Royal Commission uh, looking at institutional responses into child sex abuse. Uh, no More, which is a uh, legal service helping some of those people that I'm sure Steve will talk about a little bit. Um, over 20% of their clients um, are, have identified as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, peoples and uh, so I think it's particularly important that we acknowledge um, the impact that some of the issues we're talking about today have on those communities. Um, before I hand over to Steve who's going to be talking about the compensation rights for victims of child sex abuse, um, I might just handle a couple of housekeeping issues. Um, we're hoping to record the webinar and uh, fingers crossed the technology will let us do that um, and we'll uh, send an email around with a link to that video um, hopefully by the end of this week. You, most of you will have a copy of the uh, PowerPoint presentation that Steve's prepared to use as notes. You should also be able to access in the handouts area in your in the control panel, the GoToWebinar control panel um, as well. And again, we'll email around a link to that uh, when we send around a link to the recording. There are a couple of ways that you can ask questions of Steve as he works his way through his presentation. One is that you can press that button that looks like a hand on your control panel. We'll see what something that looks like you putting up your hand at our end. We'll be able to unmute your microphone and you'll be able to ask Steve a question directly. The other way that you can ask a question is to type a question into the questions box, surprisingly enough. Um, given the limitations of webinar technology, um, our experience is that it's generally better to hold questions over until the end if you can. If you do have a burning question, feel free to type it into the questions box or press that hand button thing. Um, that I think is the housekeeping stuff, so I might hand over to Steve Hurd. Um, Steve is a partner at Murphy Schmidt, um, specialising in personal injuries law, um, a great supporter of community legal centres uh, work, um, has been the pro bono coordinator at Murphy Schmidt for a number of years as well, um, and he's doing really important work in supporting um, victims and survivors of childhood abuse uh, to access redress compensation um, and other support. So with that, I'll hand over to Steve with great thanks and look forward to what is a really important presentation for us. All right, well thank you James for inviting me to speak today about the rights of victims of childhood abuse to seek compensation. At the outset I should say that whilst the focus of the presentation is on those who have suffered childhood abuse, a lot of the content is applicable to those who are the victims of abuse more generally. Um, I've entitled titled today's presentation, Why Now? because it is invariably one of the first questions I ask any victim of childhood abuse who contacts me to inquire whether they are entitled to seek compensation. The existence of the Royal Commission and widespread media coverage of it has resulted in many victims coming forward for the first time, and, and sorry, for the first time for the vast majority of them disclosing their abuse. As the legislation currently stands in Queensland, the vast majority of these people are outside the statutory limitation period applicable to any claim they may be entitled to pursue. Consequently, I ask this question to try and ascertain whether there is anything I can assist the victim to try and do to get around this time period. As many of you may be aware, there are currently two bills before the Queensland Parliament. One is from the other the Government and the other is from the Honourable Robert Pine MP, both of which seek to retrospectively abolish the statutory limitation period applicable to some abuse claims. Today, in addition to talking to you about the current statutory limitation period and what these bills may mean if passed, 
I really want to place you all in a position to be have a meaningful discussion with anyone who may contact you to inquire about their rights to seek compensation for abuse perpetrated against them. Unfortunately, as will become evident throughout my talk, this is usually anything but a straightforward answer. Before talking to you about such rights, I want to talk to you about what rights they do not have. Now this might sound a bit nonsensical, but the vast majority of victims I've spoken with begin by telling me they wish to apply for compensation from the redress scheme. There is, however, no state or national redress scheme. As some of you may be aware, in 2007, in response to the recommendations of the Ford Inquiry into the abuse of children in Queensland institutions, the Queensland Government established a redress scheme to provide an ex gratia payment to those who were abused in Queensland institutions. Applications to the scheme closed in 2008 and the scheme was ultimately finalised in 2010. There is now no scope for someone to apply for a payment pursuant to the scheme. Whilst the, Royal, the current Royal Commission has made a number of interim recommendations, including the establishment of another redress scheme as displayed on the current slide, there is no obligation on the various state and territory and federal governments and various institutions to actually implement a scheme. Anecdotally, we know that the various governments are discussing the issue. It is, however, anyone's guess as to whether a further scheme will be introduced. Nonetheless, it is something that we are keeping a close eye on in the event one is introduced. We do not, however, expect any real movement in this area until the Royal Commission has made its recommendations in its final report, which, after an extension to its duration, is scheduled to be delivered in December 2017. Even if a redress scheme does come in, we know from historical schemes, and it has certainly been the interim recommendation of the Commission, that any monetary payments under such a scheme should not attempt to be fully compensatory or to replicate common law damages. So, what avenues are there available for a victim to pursue at present? Well, on the current slide, I've displayed some of those as being an application for assistance from Victims Assist, to seek a compensation at order at the time an offender is sentenced, what I've called informal means, meaning informally approaching a respondent or defendant, applying for compensation via protocols established by various private institutions, justice mediation and the like, and or bringing a common law claim for damages for personal injury or pure assault and battery. Although I will not address them in detail today, it is worth keeping in mind other potential claims, such as claims for false imprisonment. And unfortunately, a lot of the victims are also in a position where they cannot work and or have become so overwhelmed that they cannot continue working. For these people, it is important to also have regard to whether they have any income protection or disability type insurance in place. Now, in 2009, the Queensland Government repealed the Criminal Offences and Victims Act, which provided a statutory framework within which to seek a compensation order for an amount up to $75,000. In the event the offender was not in a position to or did not um, pay the order, an application could then be made to the Department of Justice and Attorney General for an ex gratia payment. Now we have the Victims of Crime Assistance Act, which established a new scheme, which is a simple application style scheme. Any person who is a victim of a crime or is considered a secondary or related victim can complete a fairly straightforward application and with some supporting documents lodge the application and hopefully receive compensation. Beneficially, there is only a need to have reported the crime and no need for there to have been an actual conviction. The scheme is very prescriptive and essentially provides set benefits up to a combined amount of $75,000 for certain things such as medical expenses, replacement of damaged property and the like. Because it was not feasible to replicate it on a slide with its content, I've provided a link which you can access, um, which leads to a table which succinctly summarises the benefits available under the scheme. Whilst the scheme is very much focused on reimbursement of expenses, there is the ability to apply for compens compensatory monies. It is, however, determined by a scale based on the severity of the offence, and the potential payment only ranges from $130 up to $10,000. Although there is a discretion to accept one out of time, an application to the scheme should be lodged within three years from the act of violence. Some exceptions to this time period include if the applicant was a minor when the act of violence was commit, um, occurred, if the ap applicant is a relative of victim of violence who passes away as a result of the violence, or as you'd expect, the victim is a person with impaired capacity. Given it is very prescriptive in nature, there is really no need to have a lawyer involved in these applications. For this reason, and because there is also need, no need to pursue an offender personally, it can be an attractive option for victims who may otherwise likely incur 
significant legal costs in trying to pursue a claim against an offender personally. Other avenues of compensation can also be pursued even if an applicant is successful in receiving a payment from victim's assist. Any benefits received pursuant to the scheme must, however, be refunded should a claimant pursue and succeed in a civil claim. Now, in addition to victim's assist, and although the old Criminal Offences and Victims Act has been repealed, there is still the ability to seek an order for compensation from a court at the time an offender is sentenced. Unlike the old COVA scheme, there is, however, no ability to then apply to the Department of Justice and Attorney General if the un offender is unable or does not pay the order. For those whose sentencing comes within the ambit of it, Section 35 of the Penalties and Sentences Act provides that a court may order an offender pay compensation for personal injury suffered by a person because of the commission of an offence. Otherwise, Section 660 of the Criminal Code also provides that a judge may order the offender to pay to the person aggrieved by the person's cost of prosecution, the, the person's costs of prosecution, together with a sum by way of compensation for any loss of time suffered by the person by reason of the offence of which the offender is convicted. Now I want to pause here to make sure you are all acutely aware of the implications of a compensation order made pursuant to section 660. That is, subsection 4 provides that if such an order is made, the offender is not liable to any civil proceedings for the same cause at the suit of that person. Now, although I'm not aware of any judgments interpreting Section 660, the plain meaning is that the person in whose favour the order is made will be precluded from then recovering compensation in a civil claim from the offender. However, in the event there was another potential respondent, such as an institution for example, the victim would still be entitled to recover compensation from such a respondent. It is vitally important that a victim is made aware of the potential implications of obtaining an order pursuant to Section 660. No such restriction does, however, apply with respect to an order made pursuant to the Penalties and Sentences Act. Now, whilst courts have stated that an order for compensation made pursuant to the Penalties and Sentences Act should be assessed in accordance with the usual principles which apply to the assessment of damages in a personal injury claim, it is often the case that it is not possible to do so at the time of sentencing. The reason I say this is because, particularly if there is an early plea and sentence, the victim is often still receiving treatment and their injuries have not stabilised and consequently, it is not possible to accurately and properly assess their damages at the time of sentencing. I should also say that the compensation orders I have seen made pursuant to the Penalties and Sentences Act are often for what could be described as menial amounts and do not reflect the amount that the person would receive if their claim was assessed properly. Nonetheless, a compensation order may be an attractive proposition for someone who does not wish to incur the expense of investigating and or pursuing a civil claim. Unfortunately, however, it may still be necessary to incur significant expense in bringing proceedings to try and enforce the order against the offender. It is important that you advise any client that they will have 12 years to take steps to enforce a compensation order made at the time of sentencing or a judgment resulting from a civil claim. This is an important time period as, on a practical level, significant costs are usually incurred in defending criminal proceedings and or a civil claim. Consequently, the prospect that the offender may have exhausted any funds in defending such actions and may take time, assuming a lengthy custodial sentence is not imposed, to accrue some assets should be considered. It may therefore pay to wait for a period of time to see if the offender accumulates some assets rather than taking steps to immediately try and enforce a monetary order. Now, something which I think is far too, over, far too often overlooked, particularly by personal injury lawyers who are often consumed by the prescriptive common law processes, is the act of simply approaching and endeavouring to engage in a discussion with a potential respondent. There is nothing stopping a victim approaching an offender respondent direct and saying, let's talk about a resolution. Unless and until you try it, you will never know whether a respondent is actually willing to engage in settlement negotiations. Of course, this may be difficult with an individual offender, particularly with, for example, a claim stemming from a violent crime. There are, however, services such as justice mediation facilitated by the Department of Justice and Attorney General, which are there to assist. Also, an offender will almost certainly have some form of legal representation with respect to the alleged offence. Although the practitioner will be unlikely to have been engaged to represent the offender in respect to any compensation claim, Engaging with the practitioner may put some distance between the victim and alleged offender. 
Only three weeks ago, I took a new client inquiry from a fellow who was assaulted during a weekend soccer game. At the offender's instigation, a justice mediation will shortly take place and the offender has openly stated that during the mediation, he would like to offer money to resolve any potential claim. In saying all of this, it is often the case that individual respondents are not prepared to discuss a resolution. We have, however, found that a lot of institutions are willing to do so and have found this to be a very useful and inexpensive means of resolving a claim. To illustrate how willing some institutions are to address things informally, we recently obtained for a fellow who is out of time to bring a claim an advance on any potential compensation from a claim, which claim is far from certain, of $15,000 because his financial circumstances at the moment are so dire. Aside from informally engaging with the respondent, many institutions have implemented their own protocols to meet and address the complainants, the complaints of victims of childhood abuse. For example, the Australian Catholic Church has implemented a protocol known as, the, as Towards Healing. All of the Catholic dioceses in Australia and almost all institutions of Catholic faith are signatories to the protocol. The protocol focuses on the well-being of victims and has a pastoral or healing rather than legal focus on responding to complaints. Very briefly, the protocol is initiated by a victim completing what is known as a contact form, which details the nature of the abuse and the alleged perpetrator. If there is an unknown offender or the complaint is not one that is familiar from previous complaints or investigations, there will be an investigation where a decision must be reached as to whether the abuse is likely to have occurred. If the complaint is accepted, the relevant authority from the church, for example, the bishop of a particular diocese, organises to meet with the complainant to hear their story, offer an apology and explore if there is anything the church can do to assist the complainant. Just to name a few, we have seen assistance take various forms such as funding counselling, paying off debts, the provision of white goods and of course paying compensation. By way of another example, the Anglican Church has published a matrix it uses to determine what compensation, if any, a victim is entitled to. It also reimburses school fees where the abuse occurred at a school and at a net present value. Brisbane Grammar School also has its own mediation protocol which, although having a very legal focus, is a definite process which is aimed at avoiding the need to comply with formal legal procedures. We also know that the Uniting Church is currently establishing its own internal compensation protocol. There are of course some downsides to these processes. For example, the last thing many victims tell us that they want is an apology from the church, or they are not otherwise prepared to sit back and leave things in the hands of the church given the Towards Healing Protocol, for example, is almost completely driven by the Church. Unfortunately, time will simply not permit me today to go through all of the various protocols which exist and the pros and cons associated with them. Suffice to say, an informal approach for engaging with an institution's protocols should not be dismissed as they can, and often do, result in significant savings in terms of legal costs, then formally proceeding with the claim, and can often result in comparable comp compensation being attained. One thing that I think it is important to mention at this juncture is the need to actually ask and listen to what it is the victim actually wants. Whilst a legal process can only try to achieve monetary compensation for a person, that may not actually be what the person wants. Of course, there is no point charging off and bringing a costly, costly civil claim if one of the protocols can achieve the resolution a victim desires. Failing all that, there's the option of bringing a common law claim. Now, in the normal course of events, and in the event you wish to sue someone, it is necessary to file a claim and statement of claim in a relevant court and to then serve those documents on the person being sued. Thereafter will ensue the exchange of court documents, the gathering of evidence and the disclosure, and the ultimate holding of a hearing before a judge who would formally decide the matter. This is still the process for those bringing a pure assault and or battery claim. However, although these claims are actionable per se, regard must be had to the commercial viability of pursuing them as without a personal injury, damages may be limited. In Queensland, any person wishing to claim damages for personal injuries arising from childhood abuse must comply with the Personal Injuries Proceedings Act before they are entitled to commence legal proceedings. The Act mandates what is known as a pre-court procedure, a very abbreviated version of which is displayed on the current slide. The procedure must be complied with and culminates with the convening of what is known as a compulsory settlement conference. Unless the conference is dispensed with for some particular reason, a claimant is only entitled to commence legal proceedings should his or her claim not resolve at that conference. 
The pre-court procedure itself is not overly cumbersome and is often quite beneficial in terms of facilitating the resolution of a claim at an early stage. It is, however, still a process whereby the onus is on the claimant to establish all of the elements of his or her claim, usually being one founded in negligence. Putting aside these procedural aspects, there are, however, a number of issues pertinent to childhood abuse claims which warrant much, much discussion and which will ultimately influence the advice that is given in respect to how a claim should, if at all, be pursued. As displayed on the current slide, those issues can broadly be summarised as time evidence and the identity of the respondent, vicarious and primary liability issues, and statutory limitation periods. Now, in respect to the first issue, there is little doubt if a victim can discharge his or her evidentiary onus in establishing the abuse occurred, the victim will succeed in a common law claim against the perpetrator of the abuse. However, on a number of levels, time is without a doubt one of the most significant issues standing in the way of a victim attaining compensation for the abuse they have suffered. For one, memories fade, documents disappear or are destroyed, and given the abuse is often at the hands of someone much older, perpetrators pass away. This all makes it awfully difficult for a victim to not only establish that they are abused, but to have a living perpetrator against whom they can pursue a claim. In fact, in some cases, it is simply not possible to identify who the perpetrator was. We often spend a great deal of time and effort in trying to obtain evidence to corroborate aspects of a victim's version of events. Evidence such as statements from other people who were abused, records placing the victim in the place where the abuse occurred and at the time the abuse is said to have occurred, statements from people who can attest to seeing the victim with the perpetrator and the like. Particular to this area of law, though, is the standard of proof. An injured person is only required to establish his or her case on the balance of probabilities. However, the High Court in Brigginshaw and Brigginshaw held that where there is a serious allegation, such as with sexual abuse, the standard of evidence required to discharge a person's standard of proof is much greater. Put simply, the more serious the allegation, the more persuasive the proof must be. This can present a real issue if, for example, the only evidence is a claimant's word against an alleged offender's. Worse still if the offender is no longer alive. This is why it is so crucial that corroborating evidence is obtained. However, no, much, no matter how much evidence we gather, a victim is unable to bring a claim against a deceased perpetrator, and the chances of there being an estate still under administration or that has assets for the perpetrator is usually unlikely. Even if the perpetrator is alive, the age-old adage, can you get blood out of a stone, is a pertinent consideration. A claimant must seriously consider the likelihood that they will actually obtain any money from the offender. There are only a very limited number of searches which can be undertaken, particularly in the infancy of a claim, to try and ascertain whether a person does in fact have any assets against which an order from the court could be satisfied. Even if a perpetrator has assets, it is an awfully expensive process to obtain judgment from a court and then bring enforcement proceedings. For this reason, and pure liability reasons, we often investigate whether there is any institution or institutions with which the perpetrator of the abuse may have been associated. Aside from the liability reasons for doing so, it is these institutions which are most likely to have the capacity to meet any compensation order and or have insurance. <clears throat> in the event there is not an institution behind the perpetrator, such as if the claimant is abused by a family member or friend, then serious regard must be given to the commercial viability of pursuing a claim. Talking about institutions is a good segue into the next issue we often spend a lot of time talking to claimants about, being liability. When we say liability, what we really mean is, is the claimant likely to succeed in establishing vicarious liability for the abuse perpetrated? And in the event vicarious liability cannot be established, can the claimant actually establish primary liability against the institution? Now, as I'm sure most of you are aware, aware vicarious liability imposes liability for the wrong, wrongful act or admission of a person on another person who is not at fault themselves, even if the specific act or omission was unknown to the person at the time it occurred. Vicarious liability may arise through partnerships, someone really acting as an authorised agent of another person or entity, or most commonly in an employment relationship. Today, because it will allow me to most succinctly address these issues, I will be focusing on abuse perpetrated in the context of a school. Now on the current slide, 
are two scenarios. In the first, you have little Pete who is in grade eight and is asked to stay behind by his teacher, Mr. Cation. Then, during the lunch break, Mr. Cation sexually abuses Pete. In the second scenario, we still have little Pete, but he's boarding at a secondary school college. And part of the boarding master's duties include some intimate care of Pete, driving him around in his personal vehicle, making sure he takes care of personal hygiene, goes to bed and stays in bed each night, and anything else that may come up. On occasions, both, both while driving Pete to cricket and in his bed in the dormitory, Mr. Cation sexually abuses Pete. Now, I want you to keep these two scenarios at the fore of your mind as we go through the case law applicable to vicarious and primary liability, and we'll keep coming back to these slides. The current slide displays some of the cases we're going to briefly explore. Now, most of you will recall from university days the infamous High Court decision of Deaton's and Flew, in which it was held that a hotelier was not vicariously liable for one of his barmaids throwing a glass of beer in a patron's face, notwithstanding the fact that the patron had been abusing the barmaid. In basic terms, the High Court held that the barmaid was employed to pull beers, but no part of her duties extended to her then throwing that, a glass of beer into a patron's face. Fast forward some 60 years and the High Court has revisited this issue when it heard a combined appeal in respect to three claims by students who had been sexually abused by teachers, to which I'll refer as the Lepore decision. Two of those claims, being Semin and Rich, stemmed from Queensland where the plaintiffs alleged that they were abused in the 1960s at a single teacher school in far western Queensland by a former Deputy Premier of Queensland, William Darcy. Mr Darcy, by this stage, had been convicted of the offences giving rise to the claims. Whilst these claims were pursued on the basis of a breach of a non-delegable duty of care, the issue of vicarious liability was commented on by a number of the justices. At the heart of it all, the High Court really sent a message that sexual abuse should not be regarded as an incident of the conduct of most schools, or that the ordinary responsibilities of teachers are such that sexual assaults on pupils would normally be regarded as conduct within the scope of their employment. However, it said that there are some circumstances in which teachers or persons associated with school children have responsibilities of a, of a kind that involve an undertaking of personal protection and a relationship of such power and intimacy that sexual abuse may, and I stress the word may, be properly regarded as sufficiently connected with their duties. Now, I won't read it out, but displayed on the current slide is an extract from the former Chief Justice Gleeson's judgment, which really is what I restated just before. Now, of the seven justices who heard the matter, at the other end of the spectrum, we had Justice Callanane, who stated that negligent, even grossly negligent conduct is one thing. Intentional criminal conduct is and always has been another. Deliberate criminal conduct lies outside and indeed usually will laugh, lie far outside the scope or course of an employed teacher's duty. Whilst a six to one decision, there really was not any consistency between any of the seven justices. In fact, one notable academic stated, the High Court has once again failed to clarify the law to the point where solicitors can safely advise their clients. I think the best that could be said following Laplore is that to have any hope of succeeding on a vicarious liability argument, which is far from certain, is that there had to be more to the relationship than a mere teacher-pupil relationship. So coming back to our scenarios and with Lepore in mind, I, can think, I think it can be said that it is almost certainly the case that a finding of vicarious liability would not be made in respect to scenario one, as there is nothing more to the relationship than that of a teacher-pupil. However, in respect to scenario two, Mr Cation is driving Pete around in his private vehicle and caring for him at night. There is a whole new relationship of care and trust in place from which it could be argued that vicarious liability should be established. This is, however, far from certain and, was, as was invariably bound to occur with the lack of clarity from the High Court, the issue has come back before the courts and particularly in three notable matters. The first one is Withyman and the State of New South Wales, in which a female teacher at a special care school was found to have had sexual relations with a male student. The court ultimately accepted that the conduct amounted to sexual abuse, but notwithstanding the particular vulnerability of the student being a special care school, held that the state was not vicariously liable for the teacher's conduct. President Alsop stated that the enterprise of teaching and guiding the young, even using gentle and forgiving familiarity, does not create a new ambit of risk of sexual activity. Sexual activity is as divorced from the gentle caring teacher's role as it is from the stern, detached disciplinarians. 
spit that out. Somewhat conversely, in Ehrlich and Leifer, the Supreme Court of Victoria held that the Adas Israel School Incorporated, an ultra-Orthodox Jewish school, was vicariously liable for the sexual abuse perpetrated by the then school principal, Malka Leifer, on a plaintiff and former student, Hadassah Ehrlich. Addressing the uncertainty following the Lepore decision, Justice Rush state that what Leifer was employed to do, as well as the attributes of her employment, were matters intimately involved in her sexual abuse of the plaintiff. But I recognise the stricter test propounded in Lepore is unlikely to see the plaintiff successful. In I then went on to find that the school was vicariously liable, and in doing so stated, the relationship of Leifer, Leifer as headmistress of the school with the plaintiff is to be distinguished from the circumstances in Withyman. The nature of Leifer's power and control in the school was based on her position as head of Jewish studies, the instruction of which justified the very existence of the girls' campus. The students were vulnerable and Leifer was able to con conduct herself with unrestrained power and control within the school. Now again in 2015, the issue of vicarious liability in a school pupil abuse context claim, came before the full court of the South Australian Supreme Court in DC and Prince Alfred College. The plaintiff appellant boarded at, a, at the Prince Alfred College in the 1960s, sexually abused by the boarding house master. At first instance, Justice Banstone of the South Australian Supreme Court dismissed the plaintiff's claim as she considered that the plaintiff did not satisfy the South Australian legislation to permit an extension of the statutory limitation period. And even if he did, Her Honour did not consider the college was in breach of its non-delegable duty of care or that the college was vicariously liable for the boarding master's criminal conduct. Consistent with the reasoning of Justice Rush in the Ehrlich decision, the full court in separate decisions held that the college was vicariously liable for the acts of the boarding master. Although all giving just separate judgments, I think what the Chief Justice stated is, is relevant and that is, it is necessary to ask whether the offending was engaged in during the ostensible performance of that responsibility. In finding that must be answered in the affirmative in this case, he said that sitting on A's bed to relate bedtime stories was in the performance of his employment, responsibility, and it was that conduct which cloaked his offending. So we've gone from being in a state of uncertainty following the Lepore decision to have had three judgments, one of which failed on the issue of vicariously li vicarious liability because there was nothing more than a teacher-student relationship in place, and the other two on which vicarious liability was found because there was something more at play than a mere teacher-student relationship. Now this is very much a story to be continued, given on the 21st of July this year, the High Court of Australia heard the appeal of the Prince Alfred College decision and the argument of which squarely focused on the issue of vicarious liability. So coming back to our scenario with Pete, and until such time as the High Court hands down its decision, I think it must still be said that to have any hope of succeeding in a vicarious liability argument, there must be more to the relationship than a mere teacher-pupil relationship. That is, there is still not likely to be a vicarious liability finding in respect to scenario one, but it's some prospect in respect to scenario two. Now still with our scenario in mind, what if Pete cannot establish vicarious liability in respect to either scenario? Does that mean he'll fail altogether? Now perhaps this is a far from convincing statement, but that is not necessarily slow. So, as you all know, one of the elements that a claimant must establish to succeed in a negligence action is that a duty of care is owed. Now apart from the complexities surrounding statutory authorities, which we will simply not have time to discuss today, it is difficult to conceive a situation in which a, where a child is abused and where the perpetrator or institution behind the perpetrator would not owe a duty of care to the child. In fact, there is a clear line of authority in Australia that institutions, such as a school, owe a non-delegable duty of care to its students, and which arises due to the immaturity and inexperience of the pupils and the need for their protection. Non-delegable duties are not just limited to schools and would arguably apply to an orphanage or, say, a religious institution running some kind of children's activity. So what is a non-delegable duty of care? As opposed to a normal duty to take reasonable care, it is a duty to ensure that reasonable care is taken and it cannot be delegated to another person. It is, however, not an absolute duty. In the event that a non-delegable duty of care cannot be established, then the normal principles of a negligence claim apply and it is necessary to establish that there was a breach of the usual duty to take reasonable care. 
Because it's an issue I'll revisit in a moment, I want to pause here to make it clear that a non-delegable duty of care is not an additional duty owed over and above a normal duty of care. It is simply a modified or more onerous version, if you will, of a duty of care. A non-delegable duty in the context of childhood abuse claims was considered at some length in the Lepore decision, and as a result of which I think it can be said that the majority of the justices were of the view that a duty to ensure care is taken does not extend to imposing liability for the criminal conduct of an employee and where the employer is not at fault. The crucial point from this is the statement where the employer is at fault. That is, it is crucial to establish that the employer is at fault and in very basic terms should have and could have done something which, on the balance of probabilities, would have reduced the risk of the abuse occurring. There are a number of arguments which could potentially be raised against institutions such as a school in this respect. For example, was anyone with what would be considered management aware or ought to have been aware that the abuse was being perpetrated? For example, had there been previous complaints? Were there any checks and balances of supervision in place to ensure that misconduct could not take place? Were proper and adequate inquiries made before employing a particular person? Just to name a few. Now, before we come back to our scenario slide, two of the cases I just mentioned, being the Ehrlich and the Prince Alfred College judgments, squarely considered the fault of the employer and institution. In Ehrlich, the school was held liable because the principal's conduct was built on a position of unrestrained power control and authority that had been disposed upon her by the board. Now although I think there is a paucity in the reasoning, it appears Justice Rush was of the view that the board should have exercised some supervisory capacity over the principal, and had it done so, would have been in a position, position to prevent the abuse occurring. Somewhat in contrast to Ehrlich, the full court of the South Australian Supreme Court in the Prince Alfred College decision unanimously held that liability for intentional criminal wrongdoing of an employee is best addressed by consideration of vicarious liability rather than a non-delegable duty. Although somewhat confusing, the three justices did however consider the primary liability of the college via a usual duty of care as a notion distinct from a non-delegable duty. By a two to one majority, they held that the college was vicariously liable, but that it had not been guilty of negligence itself as, in essence, its systems of supervision were reasonable. Now being completely candid, I am at a complete loss to understand why the justices in the Prince Alfred College decision considered a duty of care as a notion distinct from a non-delegable duty of care. Whilst unsurprisingly the decision is on appeal before the High Court, this particular issue was not a subject of the appeal. I guess it could be said that is understandable given the breach of a duty of care, in whatever form, is an issue which will always turn on the facts of the particular case at hand. In any event, Let's consider our scenario slide again. At first glance, there does not appear to be anything in scenario one which could, give, which could give rise to an allegation that the school is at fault. However, what if I said Mr Cation had been prosecuted and convicted of sexual abuse in South Australia, was refused a blue card in Queensland, and the Department of Education failed to do a background check on him or insist on the provision of a blue card? Pete could then squarely raise an allegation that the department failed to follow its own protocols and procedures, and which would have resulted in the decision that Mr Cation not be employed because he did not hold a blue card. Pete would hopefully then establish a breach of the duty of care and causation as, had Mr Cation not been employed, Pete simply would not have been abused. The short of all of this, and no matter how complex those decisions seem, it is essential not to confine your focus to the issue of vicarious liability. It is essential to consider primary liability and to carefully investigate whether there is any evidence to substantiate an allegation of primary negligence being made against a respondent. Now, as I said at the outset, the Limitation of Actions Act currently provides that, in order to protect a person's right to claim damages, legal proceedings must be commenced within three years from the date on which a cause of action accrued in respect to a claim for damages for personal injuries, or within six years from the date on which a cause of action accrued in respect to a claim for damages for pure assault and battery. Unlike, for example, a motor vehicle accident where there can be little doubt about when a person is injured, the date on which a cause of action accrues can be a complex issue when you are dealing with a victim who has been abused on a number of occasions and over a period of time. The situation is less complex for a minor, as irrespective of when they were abused, whether it was on one day or over a period of time, the relevant time periods will commence to run when the minor turns 18 years of age. 
For a myriad of reasons, various studies have found that there is, for the most part, delayed disclosure, often by many years or decades of sexual abuse. The current statutory limitation period does therefore and quite obviously present a real issue for many claimants. The expiration of the statutory limitation period does not actually prevent someone from proceeding with a claim. However, in the event a respondent or defendant raises the expiration of it, it will constitute a complete defence to the claim. Now let's come back to Pete, who is now 43 years of age, and as we have seen with some clients, Pete is watching te um, the television one night and hears about the Royal Commission and for the first time learns not only that he has the right to bring a claim, but that other students at his school at the same time that he was there were also abused by Mr Cation. Pete has been suffering from de depression and anxiety for years as a result of the abuse he suffered, but has not had the, had the, has not had the fortitude to mention anything. He has always believed he was the only one abused, such that if he did anything, it would be his word against Mr Cation's word. Clearly, Pete's right to pursue a common law claim is statute barred. So is there anything he can do to get around this? <clears throat> As the legislation currently stands, the only way a claimant can obtain an extension of the statutory limitation period is if they have been under a continuous disability since they turned 18 years of age, or that disability ceased no more than three years prior to the commencing legal proceedings, or at some point within the last 12 months, or at some future time, they become aware of a material fact of a decisive character. Given the current bills before Parliament have bipartisan support in principle, and some form of the bill retrospectively abolishing the statutory limitation period looks set to pass, I do not intend spending a lot of time discussing these issues. Very quickly though, and in the event you get an inquiry before the legislation is amended, the Limitation of Action Act, Actions Act defines a person under a disability as one who is not of unsound, as one who is of unsound mind. Although unsound mind is not then defined by the Act, the Court of Appeal in Fleming and Gibson held that the relevant test for determining whether someone is of unsound mind is whether the person was suffering a mental illness which caused the person to be incapable of managing their affairs in relation to the matter in the manner of a reasonable person. From a practical point of view, it is not uncommon to, to receive an inquiry from a prospective client who is so debilitated, usually by a psychological condition, that they would be considered to be under a disability. You must therefore be alive to the possibility when taking a new inquiry. Now coming back to Pete, he is not of unsound mind, so Section 29 is likely to be of no benefit to him. And as I said at the outset, very early on when speaking to a new inquiry, I will ask in a respectful manner, why now? This is because it is usually the case that if a claimant has any hope of overcoming the expiration of the statutory limitation period, it will be in reliance on a material fact. I usually take the time to explain to the person making the inquiry that a material fact is a bit like a light bulb moment. Has a light bulb suddenly flashed inside your mind making you think, okay, I should now consider bringing a claim? It is not as simple as that though. The light bulb moment must be something really decisive about the person's right to claim damages. For example, finding out for the first time that someone else was abused by the same person at the same school and around the same time, such that it is not so much a he said, she said affair. There is someone to actually attest to the fact that the perpetrator has abused other people. Things such as finding out for the first time that a person may be entitled to claim damages is not something of a decisive nature as ignorance of the law is no excuse. Pete, learning of his right to bring a claim, will not be decisive. However, the fact that others can attest to the fact that they were abused by Mr Cation is likely to be a fact of a decisive character for Pete. This would mean that Pete has one year from the date he heard about the Royal Commission on television within which to commence legal proceedings so as to protect his right. Whilst the relevant principles in this area are quite clear, this is a very complex area of law and it is very much contingent on the particular facts of the claim at hand. A real impediment under the current legislation is, however, no matter how decisive and compelling a material fact could be for someone, it will be defeated if a respondent can establish prejudice. As I mentioned earlier, there is nothing like the passing of time to adversely affect a person's right to bring a claim and that equally applies to a person's right to defend a claim. In Pete's scenario, this might not be an issue if Mr Cation is still alive. If, however, he has passed away, and this is the first time the Department of Education has heard of an allegation of, of abuse, prejudice might be a real issue to contend with. 
Now, to address the injustices which exist here, the Government and the Honourable Robert Pine have both, both have bills currently before the Parliament which seek to introduce legislation to abolish the statutory limitation period for victims of institutional abuse. It does not appear that the bills will further be considered until the November sittings now. Both bills are said to be retrospective in effect and are for a number of reasons quite different, but do they actually address all of the pertinent issues in this area? The Government's bill is limited to sexual abuse, whereas Mr Pine's bill applies to child abuse, which is said to include sexual abuse, serious physical abuse and, bear with me, any other abuse, connected abuse, perpetrated in connection with the sexual abuse or serious physical abuse of the child, whether or not connected with the abuse, was perpetrated by the person who perpetrated the sexual abuse or serious physical abuse. So that seems to encompass most other forms of abuse. To illustrate the practical effect of this for you, I currently act for a gentleman who was subjected to some quite horrific sexual and physical abuse decades ago whilst attending two different primary schools, both of a, of a Catholic faith, but in which there are three different religious institutions involved. Psychologically, he is in an incredibly bad way. In the event the government's bill is passed, he may be in a position where he is time barred from seeking damages for the physical abuse, but can pursue an entitlement to seek damages for the sexual abuse. This not, might not present an issue for some claimants. For this fellow, however, it very likely will. I say this because his instructions are that the physical abuse is just as much a cause of his current psychological condition as the sexual abuse is. Now if the expert medical evidence is that both the sexual and physical abuse materially contributed to the onset of his psychological condition, he may be in a position where he, he might not recover any damages at all if he is unable to disentangle the two types of abuse and show that the sexual abuse would, in and of itself, have caused the psychological condition irrespective of the physical abuse. Mr Pine's bill would, however, afford him the right to pursue a claim for damages for both forms of abuse. The Government's bill also links sexual abuse directly to an institution. The bill has an incredibly expansive definition of institution and it is hard to conceive an institution where the private or public which would not come within its ambit. In fact, it is so expansive that it is arguable that it would encompass, encompass situations where, for example, a person is abused in foster care, given an institution will have placed the child in the care and facilitated the circumstances giving rise to the risk of the abuse. The Government's bill does not, however, appear to cover situations where, for example, a child is abused in their own home by a family member or friend. Whilst Mr Pine's bill does mention institutions, the amendments he proposes to the Limitation of Actions Act do not link child abuse to an institution. Consequently, it appears Mr Pine's bill will capture a situation where a child is abused in their own home by a family member or friend. Unfortunately for many victims, they have already settled claims and signed releases for going the right to further pursue a claim. Many of these claimants are likely to have settled for an amount that did not fully reflect the loss and damage they have suffered. This is because they would in essence have been buying the risk that they may not have succeeded in an application to extend the limitation period or were otherwise accepting that their claim was in fact statute barred. Others are the subject of final orders from a, court, from a court declaring that their right to claim damages is statute barred. Favourably, the Government's bill allows a person to still pursue a claim even if a court has given a judgement ruling they are out of time. It does not, however, afford a person who may have undersettled their claim the right to come back and revisit the issue. Plainly, this could result in a real injustice. Mr Pine's bill has provision for someone who not only received an adverse final judgment, but discontinued or settled their claim after the expiration of the statutory limitation period, the right to relitigate their claim. The Government has published an issues page which identifies the need to consider the definition of abuse and in institution and calls for comments and submissions. The issues I have raised may therefore be a non-event and will hopefully be remedied before the bill returns in its final form to Parliament. The Government's paper does not, however, identify the need to consider the position of claimants who have potentially undersettled their claims because of existing statutory limitation periods. Now, although very basic in its terms, Mr Pine's bill does therefore appear to avoid some of the injustice and anomalies which would arise if the Government's bill is passed in its current form. 
At present, I think the best that can be said is that it looks as though some form of legislation will be introduced which will, for some claimants, retrospectively abolish the statutory limitation period. As I hope is clear from my discussion about the other issues though, the identity of the respondent, time, evidence and liability issues, any relaxation in respect to the statutory, lim statutory limitation period will, however, only remove one of the hurdles that stands in the way of a person receiving compensation. The legislation will by, by no means open the floodgates and it will not be a straightforward road for anyone wishing to pursue a common law claim. So, with all of this in mind, what do you tell any prospective client who contacts you? Should you advise them to apply to Victims Assist for Compensation? Seek justice mediation. Approach the offender or institution informally. Apply for compensation via an institution's own protocol. Commence a civil claim. A combination of these things. Or simply sit back and wait in the hope that a national redress scheme is implemented. Do you advise them to pursue two avenues at once in the event one, ave one of the avenues does not yield any compensation? Will pursuing one particular avenue now adversely affect a person's right to pursue another avenue at the same time or a later time? The short of it is there is no one size fits all and litigation by its very nature is a very fluid process. I cannot stress enough that a personal injuries claim is anything but a straightforward process where advice can simply be given and compensation is guaranteed. Any new client we accept instructions from must begin with the taking of a detailed statement. It is only after having obtained such a statement that we can begin to understand the person's particular circumstances and that we can start to weigh up all of the pros and cons of the available avenues. Only then, and drawing on our experience of acting for claimants and in particular dealing with various institutions, can we be in a position to give strategic advice about what we think is in the client's best interests. In summary, there are a number of avenues and a combination of avenues available to a victim of a childhood abuse to seek compensation. There are, however, many and varied issues which will ultimately influence the advice we give to such victims as to which options, if any, they should pursue. Nonetheless, I hope today has given you some guidance as to how you should respond to any new, new inquiry and some insight into the issues we explore and weigh up at the time of taking a call from or meeting with a new client. So thank you all for your attention today. Not that I can see any of you, um, but does anyone have any questions or issues they'd like to raise? It's James here again, folks. Thanks to Steve for a really detailed and thorough presentation on a really important issue. Um, a reminder that there are a couple of ways that you can ask questions. You can press that button that looks like a hand on the control panel. We'll see your hand go up and unmute your microphone and you'll be able to ask a question. Uh, and the other way is to type something into the questions box. Also remind um, staff and volunteers in community legal centres who are working in this space about um, the importance of self-care and uh, recognise that you have access to employee assistance programs and I'd really encourage you to take up access to those support services if you're working in this space because um, as important as it is for us to care for our clients, it's equally important for us to care for ourselves and our colleagues working in this space. Um, Steve, I wonder if... Um, if you could um, just quickly, uh, in terms of referrals into personal injury lawyers, community legal centres sometimes have concerns about, I don't want to say predatory kind of practices around some personal injury lawyers, but it's, you know, it might be heading in that direction sometimes. If we're looking at referring clients to personal injury lawyers uh, in this space, um, maybe for an initial advice because we don't have expertise in the space. What are the things that we should be looking for and what should we be explaining to clients that um, they should be looking at to make sure that their interests are best protected uh, through that process? Sure, thanks James. Um, uh, I, I guess I completely agree with uh, some of the comments you made. Um, I guess uh, without um, putting us on too much of a pedestal. Um, we very much take pride in the fact that the only way we get our work is via referrals. Um, now, in the event you are um, looking to refer a matter on, um, one of the things that I would first and foremost say is make sure that you are referring the matter to someone who is an accredited specialist in personal injuries law. Um, aside from that, I think it's important that you refer to someone who is actually going to take the time um, to 
discuss with the person what their issue is at the time of the initial call. Um, we as a firm um, have uh, a process in place whereby if a, a matter is referred, the uh, potential uh, client will speak with a partner immediately to ensure that they are given some direction and can decide whether they want to take a step further and come in and actually meet with us to discuss their claim. Um, the other thing I guess I would say is in, to ensure that um, you know they have the opportunity to actually sit down with someone um, to hear uh, what options they do have available and someone who's going to take that time to do that, which um, we are more than happy to do. So again, I, I guess uh, what I would say again though is um, regardless of who it is, it is important that there is a referral to an accredited specialist in this area. Are there any other questions? As I said, it was a really thorough presentation and um, so no questions coming through. So can I, on behalf of the people cheering and clapping wildly at computer screens across Queensland, uh, thanks Steve for that presentation. It is um, an important area of work and one I think when um, the Royal Commission uh, does provide some guidance around uh, the types of support that might be made available to people, um, where I, th I think we should expect an increase in the number of people uh, coming to community legal centres and, and law firms and others uh, looking for help. Um, so really great to get in front of that and we're starting to get some uh, positive feedback come through on through the questions box as well, which is great. Really reflects a fantastic presentation, so thank you, Steve. Uh, can I also thank everyone who participated in this? As I said, we hope to record and distribute that um, to everyone who registered. Um, and I guess that's all, folks. We'll look forward to speaking to you soon. Uh, thanks and good morning.